It is one of the oldest songs in our book. We sang it prior to partaking of our Lord's Supper just a few moments ago. It is entitled, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It was written by a fellow named Isaac Watts back in 1707. When Mr. Watts first wrote this song, it was somewhat controversial because prior to this, almost all the songs that Christians sang in worship were based on Old Testament truths and teachings and passages. This was one that brought us into the New Testament. This is one that introduced us to more perfectly the story of Jesus on the cross. This song was also somewhat controversial because when it was first written, it was, if not the first, one of the very first Christian hymns or Christian songs that had personal pronouns in it, referred to the individual, when I survey the wondrous cross. I'm especially drawn to verse 3 of this masterpiece. See from his head. His hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown when I survey the wondrous cross? It improves us when we survey the wondrous cross. It enhances us when we survey the wondrous cross. It blesses us when we survey the wondrous cross. It challenges us when we survey the wondrous cross. It humbles us when we survey the wondrous cross. It prompts us to repentance when we survey the wondrous cross. It helps us to more fully appreciate the amazing love of Jesus when we survey the wondrous cross. Our challenge throughout this year and throughout this life that we have remaining is to survey the wondrous cross, to survey the man who hung on that tree, to look at him carefully, the love that he manifested, the life that he lived, the life that he challenges now each of us to live. Every Sunday morning of 2015, this is just our second one, but every Sunday morning thus far and every Sunday morning going forward through the year, we will survey not just the wondrous cross, but also the wondrous life of Jesus. And I thank you very much for coming together with the church family this morning with Certainly nothing is a higher priority than our study of Jesus, than our examination of the best of lives. This morning, as we continue to survey the cross, survey the wonderful life, survey the love of Jesus, I want to direct your attention to the gospel of John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 9 and following. These words from Christ to his disciples are powerful words. They are challenging words. (coughs) Hopefully they will be motivational words to each of us as we give them careful examination. John chapter 15 beginning with verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love if you keep my commandments. You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. 
No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. And then verse 17 says, These things I command you, that you love one another. I'm especially drawn here to verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. No greater love. What a statement. It's true. No greater love. It shall be the focus of our study and thought this morning. Again, hopefully the thoughts and our focus every day we're privileged to live. No greater love. When we see Jesus healing those that are hurting, we see no greater love. Whenever we see Jesus weeping with Mary and Martha, we see no greater love. When we see Jesus dressing himself as a servant, as a slave, the lowest of slaves, and washing feet of those disciples, we see no greater love. When we see Jesus hugging and blessing the little children, we see no greater love. Whenever we see Jesus feeding those that are hungry, we see no greater love. Whenever we see Jesus rescuing a woman caught in sin, we see no greater love. Whenever we see Jesus sweating drops of blood in the garden, we see no greater love. But it is especially when we see Jesus up on that cross dying for the sins of the world, it is in those moments truly that we see no greater love. He died for us. He lived for us. And now he reigns in heaven for us. You may recall that last Sunday I mentioned from Song of Solomon 2.1, Jesus is the rose of Sharon. And how he's a precious, beautiful, unblemished rose. Not a rose with thorns until the moment they place that crown of thorns on his head. And whenever we see Jesus voluntarily wearing that horrible hat of anguish, then we see no greater love. It seems to me as we survey the cross, we survey the life of Jesus and the events around his life, around his death, around his ministry, we see a lot of no greaters. For example, we see and we understand that there was no greater price paid for us than the price Jesus paid those six hours on that tree. We see also that When we look at Jesus, we have no greater friend than this friend of sinners, Matthew 11, 19. We understand that we have received no greater gift than the one we received from our Father when He gave us His only begotten Son, John 3, 16. We understand that there have been no greater words ever shouted than the words, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. We understand that there has been no greater demonstration of God's amazing grace than when Jesus took away our sins on that cross. We would agree that there is no greater mystery than how Jesus could love such unlovely people. We understand that there was no greater betrayal than the one authored by Judas Iscariot. We understand that there was no greater denial than the one uttered by Peter. I do not know this man. 
we understand that there was no greater beating than the one that Jesus received at the hands, at the fist of cowards throughout the night before the cross. And certainly we agree that there was no greater whipping than the one he took for us that day, the hands of the Roman soldier. And there was certainly no greater crime committed by man than the one committed by the mob as they shout out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And we would agree that there was no greater pain, no greater agony than that which was felt by Christ when his body was pierced by those nails and when his holy heart was pierced by all those unjust insults. And certainly also there was no greater separation than when the grieving father needed to step away from his son for a time because he's carrying the sins of the world. We also recognize that there was no greater darkness than the darkness that engulfed Calvary that day. And there was no greater thirst than when Jesus cried out, I thirst. So ironic to me. He's the water of life. And yet he has no water. And there was no greater heartbreak. Than the one felt by his mother Mary. As she is helplessly watching her son's life. Being poured out for the sins of the world. And certainly there is no greater surprise. Than the one received by the repentant thief when he heard the words of Jesus. Today you'll be with me in paradise. What a surprise. And then also there's no greater mistake. Than the one committed by the thief. Who chose to die cursing. The only one who could save him from his sins. And there was no greater confession. Than the one made by the centurion. The professional executioner was willing to step forward and say what everybody else was apparently unwilling to admit truly this man was the son of God no greater confession than that and he is the son of God no greater day than when the still heart of Jesus began to beat again No greater defeat for Satan than when on that Sunday morning the tomb of Christ did not contain the body of Christ. No greater victory for we, his disciples, than when up from the grave he arose. And certainly there is no greater message to preach than the message, no greater love. Today, We have no greater need in our lives than Jesus. If our greatest need had been for information, God would have sent us a professor. If our greatest need had been for technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been for money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been for entertainment, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. And so God sent us a Savior. He sent us Jesus. And when we see Jesus saving us from our sins, again, you know what we see. No greater love. And His No greater love obviously demands a no greater response. It it, it involves a great reply from us. Great love demands something great from us. You would agree with that. John expresses it best when he, he wrote, We love him because he loved us. We have his no greater love and then we have this no greater response than to to love him. Daily, 
with, with joyfulness, with enthusiasm, with, with relish. We love Jesus. We adore Him. He's not a part of our life. Jesus is our life. And all of that is a reply from us to His no greater love, no greater sacrifice, no greater gift. No greater love. It, it requires and demands then that no greater decision be made. And there is no better, there is no greater decision that any of us could possibly make than to love Him, to, to follow Him, to obey Him all of our lives. And we recognize that there is no greater life than the Christian life. The believing life will always trump the life of the unbeliever. We recognize that there's no greater opportunity to become his disciple than now, than today. There is no greater moment than the moment we've been given now to allow the, the sins that we have committed, that we have lived in, to be washed by the blood that was spilled at Calvary. Is tomorrow better than today to get closer to God, to embrace eternal salvation? Certainly not. There is no greater time. There is no greater day than this time, this day. I'm impressed when I read the book of Acts. Those nine sermons when people are being challenged to have their sins washed away because of this no greater love. And, and each of the times we see someone being obedient to the gospel is right away. Because they, they don't want to delay any longer doing this good thing. They know there is no merit in it. There's nothing to be gained in it. They don't want to prolong the suffering, the crucifixion of Jesus any further. They don't want to acquire more blood. They don't want to put more sins in the cup that he freely drank. They didn't need arm twisting. They didn't need coercion. Same hour, same night. Just as soon as they could get to the water, they got into the water. There's a message in that for us. Because when they're getting into the water, they're getting into the body of Jesus. They're contacting the blood of Christ. Remember Acts 22, 16? What did, what did Saul hear? And now why tarriest thou arise and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord? Saul was a man that recognized I've got a lot of sins that need washing. We all have sins. We all hopefully have already had them washed in the blood of the Lamb. But if we haven't done that, why not now? Why not now? I would like to do something that I think will be especially helpful to us as we contemplate this no greater love of Jesus and this no greater life that we should live in response to his love. I would like to invite you to direct your undivided attention to the 22nd Psalm. We have observed last Sunday and then somewhat this morning some of the details and the events of Calvary through the eyes of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've also made some observations last week of the crucifixion through the eyes of Mary, through the eyes of some of those in the crowd that day. But in Psalm 22, we are given the most unique of perspectives because in a sense, we're looking at the crucifixion of Jesus through the eyes of Jesus. This is Psalm 22, and we shall read this before we stand and sing this song of invitation. It helps us to survey the cross from the perspective of the one who is on the cross. It helps us, I think, to, to gain a perspective that is unique and it is powerful, and it helps us to better appreciate what Jesus experienced in his heart as he's on the tree for us. This is Psalm 22, and after the singing of this, excuse me, after the reading of this, we'll, we'll stand and, and sing together. If we can bless you by, by praying with you this morning, we'd, we'd love to have that opportunity. If, if we have folks that are here that, that have some issues between yourself and God, some sins that need to be repented of and, and confessed, 
in a broad way, in a public way. We'd be delighted to assist you very humbly in, in that today. You're, you're among friends here. You're among people that love you and are eager to love and forgive and encourage and never gossip about you. Never. And so if we can help you in that way or if we can take your confession that you believe Christ is Son of God and immerse you in water today as these were as these great people did many years ago in the book of Acts, we'd be blessed and honored to help you with that this morning. Contemplate eternity, please. Survey the cross as we read these words. Psalm 22, verse 1. These words will be familiar to you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of of my groaning. Now going to verse 6 and following. But I am a worm. And no man. A reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him. Since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. And my strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh my strength. Hasten to help me when I survey the wondrous cross. I see no greater love. Let's stand and sing. Why did my Savior?